Peggy, thank you for playing for us this morning. Yesterday, if I met you guys, it would have been very nice for me, especially if I was in Israel, to say, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Two little words that mean an awful lot. The Hebrew word for Shalom, if you've ever heard it before, means God's perfect peace. It even sounds peaceful, Shalom kind of flows. It can be said that man strives for this kind of degree of peace, only to discover that it's kind of hard to grasp. What we have to realize is that the only way that we can grasp this peace is to hold fast to the Prince of Peace, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we've seen the last couple weeks we talked about different types of Christian walks and about two weeks ago we talked about the embattled walk where we're fighting internally uh, with Satan to try to do what is right but we do what is wrong and we, do, and we do wrong when we try to do what is right. It's a battle that we go through in our Christian walks a lot of times. And so here's the good news is that we can take concrete steps to maintain that peace, to find that peace, that peace that surpasses all understanding. And it, what comes to mind to me then at that point in time is Philippians 4, 7, where it says that we are supposed to, as in prayer, we are able to understand and, and feel that peace that surpasses all understanding. That's what Paul was telling to the church in Philippi. Now today we're looking at James 4. And we're looking specifically at the verses 6 through 10. So James 4, 6 through 10. I invite you, if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and, and uh, work towards pulling into those verses. And we're going to see that those steps that we see in those verses 6 through 10 deal with humbling ourselves. It deals with submitting ourselves to God. And then it carries on into uh, resisting the devil. And then drawing near to God. And then on top of that then cleansing ourselves of all our sins. And then finally humbling ourselves in the 10th verse. What's important about those verses 6 through 10 is that there's two major bookends, if you will. Both of which involve humbling ourselves. And that enables us then to be on the right path in which to find peace of which this embattled walk that we go through can be put aside, and then we can realize that if we lean on our Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, that we can indeed realize that peace. So how do we find this peace? That's the title of today's message. We already looked at the focal passages of James 4, 6 through 10, and I'm going to read those out loud too. But we're going to be looking at three things. We're going to be looking at the fact that we must humble ourselves. It's in James 4, 6. We must then take concrete steps or actual steps to become closer toward God. And then lastly, the last thing we're going to do, uh, talk about is that we must take repentance, cleansing of ourselves of our sins. We must take that seriously. So those are the three things we're going to be looking at. So let me read, and you can follow along with me, in James 4, verses 6 through 10. 6 says this, But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Verse 7 continues, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God. Some translations say, draw near to God. But come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, and all your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord, and he will then 
lift you up. So you see those verses. Now what's important in those verses is that they're, they're imperatives. And what an imperative is when it comes to the Greek language, it's a command. It's not a option, it's not a suggestion. An imperative is very important because it directs a believer into knowing what steps need to be taken. And you can see as you study scriptures, there's a lot of verses that deal with imperatives that have come either from Paul or, the, or Peter or all the other different apostles and disciples where they said, this is what the Lord had said. And even came from God himself when he gave us certain commands. All the way from the Ten Commandments, come to think of it, to our Great Commission in Matthew 28. Those are all imperatives. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, these different steps that are imperatives. And the first one was in James 4, 6. Remember what it said in that? It said that he gives more grace. And that is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And you kind of wonder, where did that come from, Ed? Well, it comes from Proverbs 3.34. If you want to study that or write that down in your, in your margins, in your, bullet, in your bulletin, it comes from Proverbs 3.34. And it's very important to know that we have to humble ourselves. You know why? Because you think about the one being that did not humble himself. He ended up in torment forever. And that was Lucifer who is now known as Satan. For he did not humble himself. He considered himself to be a part of God, much like what uh, he did and used when he deceived Eve and Adam in the Garden of Eden. They wanted to become like gods also. It was pride once again. In Isaiah 14.4, if you're a fan of Isaiah, which is a beautiful book, Isaiah 14.4 speaks of very clearly what Satan did and why he fell. Satan declared this. Now listen to what he said. <laughs> and what's recounted in Isaiah. Count the number of eyes and myselfs in this. Satan said in Isaiah 14, 14. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. That's just one verse. How many eyes and myself did you see there? Yeah. Thanks, Mo. Most counting. And the thing is, is that it's very important to see that it all dealt with pride. It all dealt with that. You know, what's interesting is that God seems to outpour his grace to those who are humble. That's the beauty of God's love. God gives more grace to the humble because they see their need for it. You know, with that in mind, we must pray for humbleness. We must seek it and be thankful and realize the beauty of being humble. Now that doesn't mean to be a doormat or to sleek away slowly somewhere and not even show your head above the ground or whatever. It doesn't mean being that. What it means is to be under God. To realize that it's not all you but Him, our Lord, who's guiding our paths. And making things possible where they seem to be impossible. So there are five things and steps that are concrete, that are seen, that are explicit. Five imperatives that we must look at. And the first one, besides humbling ourselves, is when we look at verse 7. What does that say? It says, submit yourselves then to God. It's a very easy command. But you know, how hard is it for us to submit ourselves? It's a hard thing to do sometimes. Because we think, I can do it all myself. I have no need for anybody. I can do it all myself. It's all about me, I, myself and I, and whatever you might want to say. <laughs> but there's a thing that deals with submission. And what it means, the actual Greek derivative of that means to line up under. And it's interesting. What did Jesus do? That, you know, 
Think about it. He was God on earth incarnate. And when he was facing the most dire circumstance of his entire time on earth in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he say to God the Father? Did he say, I'm not doing this. I have no need for this. Let man's sin be man's sin. I'm not going to take all those sins on my shoulder just for man. After all, they've been resisting me for the last three years. What am I doing? What did Jesus say? How did he submit to God? Well, he said this. In 2242, Luke 2242. Not my will. But thine be yours. Yeah. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what it means to submit? See, our Lord lined himself under God. Now, why should we be any different than our Lord Jesus Christ when it comes to that? We should desire, we should live, every step of our life should be involved with lining ourselves underneath him in complete submission because when we do that, we then humble ourselves. That pride is put aside and Satan's going, well, doggone it, I'm not going to be able to get Ed today. He might tomorrow. But as long as I humble myself. And you know, another thing too, when it comes to humbling ourselves to God and submitting ourselves, is that we've got to draw near. And that's the second command that we saw there in that verse. To draw near, to come close. And that means when we draw near to God, it means that we come to Him by grace. You know, because God, being as great as he is, is when we come near to him and we're full of sin, he could say, I have nothing to do with you, for I have nothing to do with sin. But you know, his love is seen by the grace he gives us every day. Because when we come to him, which is promised in 1 John 1, 9, if we come to him and confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and then cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the beauty of his love. That's where grace is magnified. That's where we realize by drawing near to him that we can be close to him. That's an amazing thing. Because if you think about the God of creation, everything that we see around us was created by and through him. And he allows us with the sin that we have through his love and grace to draw near to him. When's the last time you drew near to him? Hopefully it was this morning. Hopefully it was on the way over to church. Hopefully it's 24 hours a day. Well, minus six or seven or eight hours because you're asleep. But the thing is, it's important to draw near. Because if you think about it, with your spouse, it's kind of hard to talk to your wife or your husband when you're in the living room and they're in the kitchen. Unless it's all one in the same room. But still, it's tough to do that. You have to draw near to each other in order to talk with each other, to relate with each other. It's not any different than relating to our Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. We draw near to him. You know, Paul said this. He warned the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians 2, 13, he goes, In Christ Jesus you were once far off, but have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And that's what we always have to remember when it comes to humbling ourselves, submitting ourselves, and drawing near to him, is that we're able to do those imperatives mainly because of the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross for our sins, for all mankind, forevermore. That's the gospel. Because of that miracle, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were made righteous. We were justified. The debt was paid. Sin was canceled. And we are made right with him so that when we do leave this earth, we can then simply transition to glory. That's the beauty of the gospel. You 
You know, we should never underestimate Satan. He's been deceiving mankind for millions of years, I guess. That was his main deal. He wanted to deceive and lie. That's what he does best. And so with that said, we see that the other imperative is to resist Satan. Resist him. Stand firm. Tell him, no, this is not going to happen to me today. Stand firm in your faith. Resist him. And what's the promise there? This is one of the things that we see in these verses. There's a promise in this particular snippet. He says in James, what did it say? Oh, resist the devil and he will flee. Isn't that a beautiful thing? You really don't want anything nasty sticking around, do you? Who else did that? Who else resisted Satan quite effectively? Christ. Jesus did, didn't he? Now I invite you, you write in your margins in your bulletin, that look at Matthew 4. And in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, it speaks of Jesus' battle with Satan, how he resisted Satan in the wilderness. And once again, Jesus was man, God incarnate. And he was tempted by Satan, as Satan tends to do to man. But what's beautiful about our Lord is that he resisted Satan. And how did he do that? Did he just kick Satan in the face? Punch him in the nose? What did he do? Well, let's look. Matthew 4.1 says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Verse 7, Jesus answered him and says, It is also written, Isn't it kind of neat how God uses Scripture here? It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. But here's Satan he still needles in, tries to find that kink in the armor, constantly sitting there striking from all different areas. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And Satan said this, All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Wow. Pretty bold of Satan. And then Jesus finally said, I'm kind of tired of this guy. <laughs> and Jesus said to him in verse 10, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And here's what's really beautiful about this in verse 11. And then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. That's the reason why we have that one imperative, that one command to resist the devil. What should have been done in that verse was resist the devil by quoting scripture back or recounting scripture. But I love the fact that there's a promise there that if I resist the devil, he will flee from me. Just like he did to Jesus. And he'll tempt you. Well, all mankind, temptation will come by virtue of the curse that was laid upon us in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve. That's our nature. But you know, who's inside us now in our hearts are stronger than what's in this world. Satan's of this world. It's pretty much all he can do is just be in this world. But he cannot destroy what's inside us through the Holy Spirit. To be able to sit there and 
quote scripture is very important. That's why it's important to memorize scripture. Whenever you can, fall back on scripture you always know from the top of your head. That comes right to mind. Because you know, if you're quoting scripture, even in the top of your head, or even out loud, you're not going to be thinking about what you're about to do that Satan was tempting you to do. If you think about it, next time you're tempted, try this. I challenge you. Next time you're tempted, quote your life verse. The verses you always come to all the time. And say, Holy Spirit, give me the power. Lord Jesus, give me the strength to resist this temptation. And then quote that scripture. And you're going to see and find that what you were thinking about doing that might have been gratifying or satisfying to the fleshly desires that are a part of being a human being will then vanquish. Satan will then flee. It's promised in scripture. If it's in scripture, it's true. It's not some false promise. It's a true, illicit, complete, beautiful promise. That's why it's been brought out this morning, to understand that if you resist Satan, he will flee from you. We talked a couple weeks ago about oh, some things with Scripture, dealing with the armor of God. And we saw that in, in Ephesians 6. But that's a whole other sermon, too. We looked at that before and talked about it. But Ephesians 6 talks all about the whole armor of God. And that's verses 10 through 18 talks all about what it means to take on the whole armor of God. And the key one is that shield of faith. And when you look at a shield of faith, when you look at a Roman shield, they were made very, very strongly, and they were made <coughs> to the point where you can actually resist and, and, and fight off the fiery darts that came into it from the enemy. That's what they're like. That's what those shields are about. Another stepping stone that we want to look at when it comes to finding peace, and this is very important, is that we need to cleanse our hands. It said in the uh, I'm looking at the verse here, if I can find it. Yeah, it's right there. Come to near to God, it'll come near to you. Wash your hands. There it is. It's in verse 8. It's kind of hidden in there. It says, cleanse your hands or wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So what does it mean to cleanse your hands? It means to wash your hands. We've been doing that quite often here lately with what's going on in the world. But it's very important to see what it means. Clean hands and a pure heart are necessary to draw near to God. One of the key things that keeps prayer from being answered is unconfessed sin. Did you know that? Unconfessed sin is what stands in the way of prayers being answered. And so what that means is that when you come to pray to God and you've done your praising God, which is the first part of it. The second thing that happens after you praise God and adore God comes confession. And you don't have to do it like it when I was a little Catholic saying, well, God, I, I lied six times last week and, and hit my brother in the face two times last week. It, it's nothing like that. It deals primarily with keeping in mind what you had done to stray away from God and ask him for forgiveness for that straying away, and then turn back, which is repentance. It's easy to ask for forgiveness. But you know what's hard? Repentance. That's what's hard, because that's a complete turnaround from where you're at. If there's a sin that you habitually go to, repentance might not be taken hold as much as it should. In other words, the seriousness of it might not have taken into your mindset of what it means to repent. And this might make some people uncomfortable right now. Good. It's supposed to. But the thing is, is that to repent can't be done on our own power. To repent, you have to realize and lean back on the Holy Spirit to give you the power to repent, to turn 
It's a complete turning. And the way that you can turn and steer that boat to where it's supposed to go is by having that anchor pulled up, having that rudder moved by the word of God to the right direction. Once again, that's why it's important to open your Bible, to understand what you're reading, to sit there and take it in full context of what you're reading. And not little snippets, but the whole thing. That's why I said before, when you are reading Scripture, just don't take one verse. Look two verses ahead, look two verses behind. That gives you the full breadth, the full context of what Jesus was saying in that Scripture at that time. <clears throat> 